is God is not through with us yet. Psalm 103, which we will read, I will read from the screen this morning. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all His benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As far as a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him, and His righteousness to children's children, to those who keep His covenant and remember to do His commandments. The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen. Father, may you richly bless this reading of your holy word for us this morning, in this place, and in this time. May it change our lives, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. Some years ago, it was a bit, of surprise, a bit of a surprise to me when I found out that the word often used for graduation, for commencement, means beginning. That, I think I learned that in high school. Graduation means to face a new beginning. And generally, success means to face a new beginning. And today, we have a song of new beginning for every situation in life. Our hearts, our homes, our church, which I want to talk about some today. And where the Lord places us on His mission field. Psalm 103 is a song about our past, our present, and our future. The past. 103, 1 through 5. Remember, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. God's blessing. God's life for us versus the pit. That's what we have for ourselves, the pit. What God has for us is life. <laughs> Having a gratitude attitude towards the Lord versus, like, what have you done for me lately kind of thing. I want to tell you, the Lord has done a lot for us lately. <laughs> Forgives our sins. Heals our diseases. Healing comes in many shapes 
and sizes. Favorite story of mine about Helen Keller, who was deaf and blind, met every president from Grover Cleveland to Lyndon Johnson to LBJ, and was friends with many famous people. Do you know how, how, how healing came to Helen Keller's life? She said this, I thank God for my handicaps, for through them I have found myself, my work, and my God. Fanny Crosby, famous hymn writer, was blind from a young age, wrote little hymns that we know called Blessed Assurance. Uh, To God be the glory. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. While others are calling, do not pass me by. At the end of her life, she thanked God for her blindness. Healing comes in many shape, shapes and sizes. St. Paul appealed to God for healing. God said to him, my power is made perfect in weakness. St. Paul found a new way to live. Remember God's blessings. He heals our diseases. He redeems us from death. He crowns us with love and compassion. Satisfies our desires. Gives righteousness and justice. The past, the present. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Divine guidance. The future. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, you mighty angels, you mighty ones who do His bidding. Those who do the Lord's will with a song in their heart. A, a Bible study changed me some years ago by a guy named Henry Blackaby. I heard him down at Sandy Cove. He had the privilege of asking him to pray over me and say a prayer for me, which he graciously did. He said, the work of the church is this. Find out what God is doing and be a part of it. Find out what God is doing and be a part of it. Many contexts today for this psalm, but uh, today I just want to talk a little bit about our church. We had an annual conference, I've been reappointed, and, and today I, I was actually going to kind of do something like this at the, at the last council meeting, but unfortunately I had an accident on my way there, or fortunately, because I felt like God was saying to me, right thing to share, wrong place to share and so, here goes this morning. But again, remember this, Psalm 103, the past, the present, the future, any situation, it's a, it's a psalm of blessing. The Lord wants people who to do His will with a song on their heart. The past, remember. As a church, we need to remember. Remember God's blessings. Do not forget all his benefits. I don't want to catalog them this morning, but we've had many miracles on the way. Many miracles on the way. I had a couple of, uh, you, you know, one of the miracles on the way, we heard Homecoming Sunday when uh, Jane Petrie came up and, and shared. And she said her mother came home and and like practically gave him a high five. She said it was a good Sunday. We had 16 people in church today. Lord has brought us along. Through the years I've had people make motivating comments to me. Somebody one time said to me on my third or fourth year into appointment. An, an elderly uh, pastor, pastor in a real big church said to me. Ah, oh, you just got a little, you know, you got a little family church there. Another pastor said to me, uh, your church, uh, uh, has great dinners. Have you had any good dinners lately? He just kind of like, you know, he was putting me down. Just saying, you know, all they do is they, you know, they serve good food there. You know, and I just, when people say stuff like that to me, it just gets inside of me. It's like the irritant in the oyster that I pray God makes a pearl. Another lady said to me, I was on a baseball field. She said, uh, you're a pastor where? I said, I don't remember the church. She said, I just thought that place was a decoration. <coughs> like, oh, oh, okay. Well, the one, the first guy said it. He's retired. The second guy's dead. <laughs> and, uh, the third person's not doing particularly well. <laughs> You gotta, as a church, 
remember where we've come from. And the bottom line is this. We're riding the wave. You don't conjure this up. You don't make this up. It's a movement of the spirit. You're riding a wave. There's a, there's a wind. And, and I believe today there's more wind and wave for us to catch. Now I want to talk about the present. But first, let me begin with a story from the past. Years ago, the, over at the, 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 the Morristown Church, uh, that this guy named Bill Eason, this big Texas dude, telling us how to grow churches. And there at the round table, I was sitting eating lunch with a colleague of mine who was a pastor in a small church not far from here. And there at the lunch, he wanted to impart his wisdom to this man from Texas. He said, I think we should close all these little churches. And just make a big church. You know, just kind of say, yeah, let me be pastor of it. And, uh, you know. And so he said what he wanted to say to the big shot. You know, imparted his wisdom to the big shot. And then he left the table. And so I had Bill Eastman to myself, this big guru. I, I described the church. Described, well, I think we're four or five years in our ministry. I described the church. I told him all about it. He looked at me in his Texas jaw and said... How's your marriage? <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> he was suggesting that a church like a church three or four years in our ministry, it was it's an intense thing, and it's he was saying to me, You better have a good marriage, kid. You know, because it's gonna be a lot of work, as well as riding the wave of the spirit. Then he said to me, I said, Well, what's your advice to me? In his Texas draw, I said, Think small, go slow, go with the flow. <laughs> Think small, go slow, go with the flow. Which meaning, which he meant, follow the Holy Spirit. Go with the flow of the Spirit. Go with God. Never had a secret plan to grow our church. We're riding the wave. And I believe we're still riding the wave. From my heart. This is all just, you know, the president gives a state of the union. Made it a little bit of this today is a, 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 a state of the church. I think there are two extremes <clears throat> in any situation. One is this, hey, we're fine. Everything's okay. We don't need anything. The other is uh, panic. Hey, I wonder what they're doing over there. Can we do that here? Oh, you know, like, ooh, they got a lot of people over there. I wonder what they're doing. Maybe we should do that too. In between that is God communicating with his people. There are barriers to growth. There are barriers to growth. And we built a wonderful building. And here we are today. We've been riding away. But I just want to tell you, in a church about our size... Our attendance varies between like 120 on a low Sunday to 150, 160 on a good Sunday. In that size church, sometimes the church can kind of get stuck in a glass ceiling. and just kind of stay that way. And unless the church addresses that, they're doomed to be in that size for years to come. And I can give you chapter and verse and addresses in churches where that's been happening for about 30 to 40 years. What are the barriers that churches face? The first is they're unclear about the calling to grow. That God calls every church to grow. Barrier number two is they're unaware of the glass ceiling. Barrier three is in its main worship service it gets filled up. Now interestingly, a church is filled up when the back pews are filled and when you have to walk over people to find a seat. Or when... At 9.25, can you find a parking spot close to the door? Now, I didn't make that up. I'll give you chapter and verse where I got it from. Another barrier is not being staffed for growth. That you don't really have the infrastructure to begin to receive and to be a part of what God is doing. Another barrier is our concept of an adequate budget does not permit growth. Just a few things. By the way, our church is a top church in our conference. 
And I want to tell you a little story. You're going to read about it. You're going to read about it in the uh, newsletter that's coming up. Because I'm putting the whole thing in there. But there's a guy named E. Stanley Jones. Famous missionary from India. This guy was fantastic. I love when I find out more about missionaries. Today in Adult Sunday School, I'm going to try to find out a little bit more about Fanny Crosby. It's our last Adult Sunday School of the year. Just a couple things uh, that we want to do. And you're welcome to be there. But mm, I didn't know this. E. Stanley Jones, this famous missionary, he had a nervous condition. He was a total mess. He was like John Wesley. His first mission trip was a disaster. <laughs> he went home and spent a year at home to recover. Then he went back and nothing had changed. He was, he was a mess. One night, God said, are you ready to do the work that I want you to do? And he said, no way. I'm done for. I'm not ready to do this. I'm at the end of my resources. And God said to him, if you will turn that all over to me and not worry about it, the voice seemed to say to him, I will take care of it. And E. Stanley Jones said, I'll take that bargain. And it changed his life. That's where I'm at right now. Nothing to worry about. God is for us, who is against us. We're in a move of the Spirit of God. I believe God is calling this church to be a church until Christ returns. We've got 300 souls around us who are going to help us do that. I don't see many businesses wanting to come in surrounded by a cemetery. But you never know. Wouldn't that be cool? If we put a stake in the ground and said, we want this church to be a church until Jesus Christ comes back. Wouldn't it be great if it was even the United Methodist Church? But all we are is a renewal movement in the church. That's, that's what we are. The future. God has a plan for Asbury. A failure to plan is a plan to fail. I have a personal goal. Just bear with me for a couple of minutes. Because a lot of this is personal. It's very personal. This is my personal mission statement. To be an instrument of renewal in Jesus' church. That's what I want to be. I want to be an instrument of renewal in His church. I was conceived on Christmas Eve. My parents told me that once. <laughs> and they assured me that it only happened one time. <laughs> I was named after two grandfathers, John Wilbur Dahl and William Lewis Speakman. I'm John William Dahl. Both of my grandfathers were spiritual men. They were men of God. I had the shock of my life at this past annual conference. I'm sitting in my room going over the conference agenda. My grandfather's church, first church in Carney's Point, was officially closed down. Hope a Pentecostal church buys it so that it may be a church until Christ returns. I hope that happens. I hope it doesn't turn into an art gallery. But I emailed my brother. And I said, Fred, do you remember being at that church at a church meeting when Grandpa had plans to expand the church? And Freddie remembered more of that meeting than I did. It was a meeting right after church. And I still remember this lady with vicious eyes pointing her finger at my grandfather and saying, I don't see how it can be done. Freddie even remembered the cost of the project. I think it was $75,000 just to make their place. This was like in the late 60s, 67, 68. I was like eight years old. And I have a photographic memory, though, for things that happened in church because I have a confession to make. I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere until I walked into the family of God, into the church of Jesus Christ. I can go anywhere in the world, and I belong because of Jesus Christ. I do remember when we had a needs assessment right before we built the building, and our consultant said, her name was Pat Hayes, she said, yeah, when, you, when a church splits about a building project, she says it usually takes decades to get back to it. 
It'll take a while. Unfortunately, some churches never get back to it and just kind of just kind of go on a downward slope. I'd love our church to be a church until Jesus returns. I'm 51. By God's grace, I plan to pastor at least till I'm 62. Or to whatever the minimum social security age is. Okay? I don't care if I'm walking, running, rolling, or whatever. I'm going to be doing this. And even when I retire, because a lot of you are retired, busy people. Okay? You're very busy people. I, I see what you do. Uh, I, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be doing this. I'm in an itinerant system. I'm here 20 years. I'm the longest man in the district. Uh, there's nobody in the capital district that, that's been in the church longer than me. I asked God, what do you want to do? What, what do you want the future to be? And I hear a four-letter word from God. It says, stay. Years ago. personal stuff, but I'm just, I need to testify this morning. Years ago when I was diagnosed with MS, I don't have MS, but I was diagnosed with MS. But the, you know, the lady and the man on Christmas Eve, she had an x based chromosome that uh, is giving me the, the condition. And I still love your mom no matter what. Okay? But they diagnosed me with MS, and it was chronic progressive MS, they thought. Which basically means that, you know, you don't have too much longer. Or you're really looking at some really serious issues. I have issues, but not those kind of issues. I went into the chapel of uh, Thomas Jefferson Hospital. And where my dad got treated for pancreatic cancer. But I was being treated for something else. I went to the chapel. I said, God, you gave my dad three years. Would you give me 30 I really did. I said, and, and it's like, I felt like, you know, I'll think about it. You know, that felt like that was my answer. But you know something that's called bargaining. But I bargain with God any day before I sell out to say You can bargain with God. He'll listen to you. He'll talk with you. And I was healed of that mess. Because it don't happen. Whatever. God is good. Why am I sharing this with you today? I pray I've given you a, a universal psalm that will help you in every walk of life. With a past, with a good past that Christ has redeemed. With a present that Christ is present for. And a future. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for harm, to give you a future with hope. I believe for our church there needs to be a plan. I think we need to clarify who we are. I think we need to communicate. I think we need to talk to God and to each other. And I think we need to commit to put a stake in the ground and move forward. Why can't we just stay just like we are? Because if you ever decide to stay just like you are, you're going to decline. You're either growing or you're declining. There's no staying where you are. It may even be okay for us. I think we'd do okay if we just wanted to stay just as we are. I like it myself. But that's not to our children's children. It's just us. And in fact, as I discern the spirit, I think a new mission focus of our church, it needs to be young people, and older people. I find that young families are clueless today. And it's not the clueless ones who come to us. They're the ones with the clues. But there are people out there who just have no idea about anything. And then they wonder what happened later. Well, hello. Help us, Jesus. And older People. A lot of you are doing this already. People come to us. I'm not talking about young retired people, but 
They need that fellowship too, but older people just have really severe needs. You go out to give somebody a ride to the doctor, and you find out that they don't need just a ride to the doctor. They need a gallon of milk. They need groceries. In fact, they need somebody to figure out where they're going to go from here. And they don't have people. Or if they do, they live across the country. And you know something? Focus on younger people. Focus on older people. Kids, youth, older people. They don't compete. They complete. It's the circle of life. It's the circle of life. It's a part of our 200th anniversary. And I'm going to talk about this more at our next council meeting. I propose we bring in a consultant. It's a part of our 200th anniversary. It's not cheap. It's part of a year-long thing. And that we have, and that we bring somebody from the outside in, a fresh set of eyes, who will sit with us and help us to, to determine the kind of church we're going to be before Jesus returns. Several things have kept us together. God has a plan for the, our church is the chief one. And if you're here this morning, if you're not here this morning, you're on the ground floor. You are on the ground floor of God doing something great. And you know, you're not going to hear about this next week. And I'm not going to, you know, and I even feel a little funny doing this this morning, but I felt a strong leading. But for us today, I conclude, it's a little bit like us being on the sandlot. Remember the sandlot games and like we're playing football or baseball and, and only what we're doing is much more cooler and important than that. If you're here, you're on the ground floor, but it's, it's kind of like we're on the sandlot together and I, I hear people saying exciting things like, let's pay down that mortgage. I hear people say, we need to hire an assistant and more program staff. I hear people saying, I like it just the way it is. And I don't want to do anything to change it. And I want to tell you, I've been here 20 years. I hope you have enough faith in me as a leader that I don't like to alienate people from something they like. I don't add by subtraction. I believe addition is addition and not subtraction. That you add. I hear people say more mission. I hear people say more for older people. That's the group we need to focus on. I hear people say, more for younger people. That's the group to focus on. Many other ideas as well. But kind of like on the sandline, it's like, you know, give me the ball, I'll go all. You know, throw me a Hail Mary. We'll see how it works out. But this is the word I have from the Lord. We're not a sandlot church anymore. We are in the big leagues. We are in the big leagues. We're one of the strongest United Methodist churches in the area. We have one of the biggest vacation Bible schools in our area. People drive by, they say to me on the ball field, what are you doing? Why are all those cars there? That's why I humbly suggest as your pastor and it'll come up to council meetings. We're really going to do things at council meetings. If you have an opinion, come. If you have a better idea, lay it on the table. God speaks through his people. I pray this morning to be a church until Jesus returns. To be very serious about that. We have a cloud of witnesses surrounding us who are helping us at this very moment by being buried in our churchyard. And be with Jesus today in the courts of heaven. Reverend Tussie and a whole host. Do not forget his benefits. We need to remember what God has done for us. We need to realize and know that he's with us. He has a plan for us. And we need to remember that we're to give our righteousness. His righteousness to our children's children. And I close real honest. <laughs> it's like the little boy in the back of the church saw his minister take off his uh, 
take off his watch. He said to his friend, what is that? And he said, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> this psalm reminded us that we're... This psalm reminded us that we're here and we're gone. God has told me this, whispered to me, and Gwen and I have talked about this. This is the most important thing any of us got going in any of our lives. This church is the most important thing that any of us got going in any of our lives. You want to make a difference for eternity? Spend it here. Give it here. May it happen here. You, you, you wonder where you're going to experience glory and fellowship and love and, and, and where you're going to feel connected the second you die? It's from coming here in Christ Church. I tell people, know Jesus is your Lord and Savior and find your spot. It's here. It's going to happen here. You know, the, 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 the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. It's here. And you and I get to play in the sandbox. All God's people said. Amen. Amen. Please pray with me. Jesus, we love you. We love you. And I just, I humbly offer this, Lord. Whatever you want to do, do it. Or don't do it. Whatever you want to do, just help us each to ride the wave of your Holy Spirit. And help us to catch your wind. Where the wind is at our face, help us to make turns so that your wind may fill our sails. Maybe that's like Helen Keller. Realizing in Fanny Crosby that healing comes in different shapes and sizes. <coughs> Help us, Lord, to open ourselves to you. And to be a part of what you're doing. And to have fun. Have joy. To even bless you while we're doing it. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said. Amen. We'll sing our closing song on this graduate Sunday, on this Sunday of commencement, on this Sunday of new beginnings. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Amen. Please rise.
bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.